Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma la'almanana ila ma'alamtana fa'alimna. Wa la fahmanana ila ma'fahamtana fa'fahimna ya Rabbil Alameen wa ba'd. Um, last time we started the prayer chapter or the chapter of Salah. We talked about the prerequisites for Salah. We talked about the conditions of validity of the Salah. We talked about the pillars and the main foundations of the prayer. And then we talked about the Sunan that are not part, the Sunan that are not part of the, of the Matan or the textbook specifically, but the, the Shaykh who translated the book or the Matan, he actually added them. So, reading or reciting Surah Al Fatiha, is it a fard in the prayer or one of the sunnah of prayer? Fard. In all prayers? Whether a person is individual or in a jama'ah? Okay. Uh, the, in the book, he mentioned 15 different sunnah of the salah, 15 different recommended actions that a Muslim is required or is highly recommended to perform in the prayer. So, can you mention some of the sunnah of the salah? Something sunnah recommended that you do in your prayer. Raising your hand when? When saying Allahu Akbar. How many times do we raise our hands in the salah? Only once? I do it once, but I see people doing it many every time. Okay, so yeah, so how many times we are recommended to raise our hands? Takbirat al Haram, of course, that's number one. Four. Can you say one more? Uh, Four, including takbirat al ihram. Yes. Okay. So can you say one more? Uh, when you go in from uh, uh, standing up to the court. From standing to rukwa. Yes, that's number two. Yes. Stand up from rukwa. Stand up from rukwa. That's number three. Number four. Hmm? Go, no, going to sujood, there is no, there is no rafa. You don't raise your hand when you go. After you raise from, from the ruku'a and you go into sujood, you do not raise your hand. You just bow down or you go down for the sujood. So what is the fourth? After getting up from the second tashahud. After the first tashahud. After getting up from the first tashahud to the third rak'ah in a prayer that consists of more than two rak'ahs, you raise your hand. So again, the four times you raise your hands in the prayer. First of all, there is a khtilaf about this. So you'll find some people, you know, when they pray, they raise their hands only in takbiratul ihram. That's one madhab. Specifically, Hanafi madhab, they raise their hands only in takbiratul ihram. This is the only time they raise their hands in the salah. So that's right. If you see somebody doing that, that's correct. That's one of the opinions. Another madhab, including the Shafi'i madhab that we are studying, you raise your hands four times. Takbiratul ihram, number one. As a sunnah, that's sunnah. When you are going, to make ruku'ah. When you're bowing down for ruku'ah, you raise your hand, Allahu Akbar, and then you go down. Then when you raise, you stand up after the bone of the ruku'ah, and then when you stand up after the first tashahad for the third rak'ah. So any prayer that consists of two cycles or two rak'ahs, that means you only have three times. In, in, in the first one, and for ruku'ah, and raising from the ruku'ah. Three times, I mean, and you repeat it in every ruku'ah you do, of course. But in any salah that includes more than two rak'ahs, that means when you raise or stand up after the second rak'ah, after the tashahud, the first tashahud, you raise your hand. So this is the, uh, the, the four times that we raise our hands in the prayer. Okay, what, what are other sunan in the salah? Yes. Saying ameen after surah al-fatiha. Yes. What else? Yes. Reading surah after al-fatiha. Yes. Putting right hand over the left. Brothers, yes. Dua ul istiftah, the opening supplication at the beginning of the prayer. We need one more brother to give a sunnah in the salah. One more sunnah you perform in your prayer. Yes. The first one. Yes, the first tashahud is a sunnah. Yes. The second taslim, yes. The second salam. So at the end of the salah, you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. First, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The second. The first one is a must. The second one is not. Again, when you say it's not a must, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You keep doing it, of course. 
But it's not a must, that means if you miss it for any reason, if you skip it, your prayer is failed. That's the, that's the reason we study the obligations and we study the recommitted actions. The last part we talked about last time was about some spiritual concepts that we learned from the Salah. About the ikhlas, about sincerity, about uh, devoting all of our actions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he talked about showing off in the riya during the Salah or any other time. And then today we talk about the invalidators of Salah. Things that annul the Salah. That invalidate your Salah. So he said, وَيُبْتِلُ الصَّلَاةَ الْكَلَامُ عَمْدًا وَلَوْ بِحَرْفَيْنِ وَنَاسِيًا إِنْ كَثُرًا Say so prayer is invalidated by speaking intentionally, even to phonemes, or unintentionally if a lot. This is the first one. If you speak in your salah. The Prophet وسلم, said in the hadith, human speech is not befitting during prayer, rather it consists of glorying Allah, declaring His greatness, and reciting the Quran. Any type of speech other than these three things, you cannot do in your salah. Obviously, you cannot talk to someone when you pray. Right? Not only talking to someone, you do not have to be talking to someone. Just uttering any kind of kalam that is not part of the salah, which means it's not part of Quran, it's not part of a dua and salah, it's not part of a dhikr, that would actually invalidate your prayer. Even if it's only two letters, whether these two letters give a sound meaning or not, this will invalidate your salah. And that's, that's a dhabit, that's a rule that the scholars put. Say two letters or more, whether it gives a meaning or doesn't give a meaning, that invalidates your salah. Okay, but he differentiated between two things. He said intentionally or unintentionally. So intentionally, of course, that invalidates your salah. Unintentionally, if it is not Allah, that's okay. If it's Allah and even it's not intentional, that invalidates your salah. You cannot keep talking for 10 seconds unintentionally, right? If that happens, even if unintentionally, your salah is invalid. You have to redo your salah. You have to restart your salah. So that's, that's the reason he differentiated between intentional speaking in salah or unintentional speaking in salah. But he said the two phonemes, which means two letters, with, he didn't say letters because he means generally. Whether it gives a meaning, it delivers a meaning, or doesn't deliver a meaning. Like for example, in Arabic language, when you see the word min, min doesn't give a meaning by itself, right? Just a letter, we call it a letter in one of the prepositions. It doesn't give a meaning, but this invalidates your salah if you do that intentionally. Because there are two letters, right? Sometimes it might be only one letter, but it gives a meaning. One letter you pronounce, and that gives a meaning. In Arabic language, some of the verbs are only one letter. When you say, for example, qi, that's a qaf with kasra, right? That's a, that's a verb, that's a word. That's actually a sentence, by the way. It could be a sentence. When I tell you qi, it could be a sentence. When I tell you i, ayn with kasra, that could be not only a letter, not only a word, it's actually a sentence. Because it's a verb, it's an amr, it's an imperative verb. Qi means qi nafsaka, it means like protect yourself. I means try to understand. Nwa'a, like understand, listen. That, that would happen. That's one letter that actually gives a sound meaning. This invalidates your salah. Again, if that's intentional. If it's unintentional, sometimes you just like. Unintentionally, you pronounce a letter, or you pronounce a word unintentionally, that's okay, right? And that always happens, or most of the time happens, when you are not khasha in your salah, right? Sometimes you might just utter a word or a letter because you're not really in, in mindful of your prayer, and unintentionally you just say a word. Sometimes you might say something in English in your prayer, right? Or like you're, you're unintentionally and something happens, and whatever word that comes out from your, from your mouth, because you're not really focused on your prayer and you just utter something. This wouldn't invalidate your salah. So this is the differentiation between uh, something that you do intentionally or something that you do not do uh, intentionally. Zayd ibn Arqam, one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, we would speak during prayer at the beginning of, like during a little bit beginning of the Islam, before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them through the Prophet sallallahu that you cannot be speaking during prayer. These, he said, we used to speak while we are praying because they didn't know it's haram. They didn't, not just, they didn't know it wasn't actually legislated to be something haram or something that invalidates the prayer. He said, we would speak during prayer. One of us would speak to his brother concerning his needs and they are praying. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, be guardians of your prayers and of the midmost prayer and stand up with devotion to Allah. 
Hafidu ala salawati wa salati al-wusta wa qumu lillahi qanitin. This last part of the ayah, wa qumu lillahi qanitin, is the dalil for this. It's actually the evidence for this. So he said, and we were commanded to be silent. After this ayah was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ commanded them, you cannot be speaking while you are praying. So this is the, the, the first thing that invalidates your salah. What if you use an ayah from the Quran to deliver a message to someone who's listening to you? You're praying at home, somebody knocks at the door, you're the only one in the house, and you said, Utkuluha bi salamin amin. Right? You wanted just to, to imply, like, okay, you, you're allowed to enter. Right? A uh, little kid came and he wants to grab something. He said, Ya Yahya, put the kitab before. You want him to just grab something from next to you. Seriously, the, these are some of the discussions that the scholars had. They said, if you recite the ayah with the intention of delivering a message to someone, this invalidates your salah. And that's the Quran. If the recitation is not of the intention of reciting Quran in prayer, it's not considered as a recitation in prayer. Right? Like if you use the ayah outside the prayer because you tell someone something, you're not reciting the ayah, you're, take, you're telling a person something. Right? There are some other details they mentioned. They said if you do it with combined intention of both, that might not invalidate your salah, but it's not recommended. Like you wanted to deliver a message, but you are actually reciting this surah, and it happened that you wanted both to happen, that could be okay. Your prayer is okay, but it's not recommended. But if your main intention is to tell someone something, this will invalidate your salah, even if you are using an ayah from the Quran, that it's okay to be recited during the prayer. So this is about uh, the first invalidator of speaking intentionally or unintentionally in the prayer. The sec the sec we'll just uh, take the questions at the end, sorry. The second one is the, the excessive motion in salah. He summarized all of them in this sentence. So number two, he said it's invalidated by excessive motion, such as taking three steps. Even if it's accidental, by the way. The, the differentiation between small amounts of motion and excessive amounts is that the excessive amounts are possible to avoid. Like as I said, three consecutive motions, three consecutive moves in your salah. The, most probably you can avoid this. And being consecutive, that's one condition of this to invalidate your prayer, by the way. So if you do one move and then you just rest and you're, 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 you're just silent, you're not doing anything. And then like a few seconds, one minute later, you do another move and then you do another move after one minute and then you do another, no matter how many moves you do, your prayer is okay. You take about three consecutive moves, moves or motions in the same time. You move something and you close and then you grab something and then you, do, you, you moved one step, all three in a row. This invalidates your salah. Whether it's the same action and you are repeating it or three different actions, this invalidates your salah. But again, like disconnected motions in the salah, separate time, separate rak'ah, or even the same rak'ah but separately, this doesn't invalidate your salah. But if it's for no reason, it's of course makroom. It's something that is not recommended, something that's actually very disliked because it takes away from your khushu, right? If there is no reason of, 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 of doing this. So that's, that, this is the way we differentiate between excessive motions or not. The, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they reported that he would, he would carry while he's praying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umama bin Tuzaynab, one of these like daughters of the Sahaba, she was a very little baby. He would carry her Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he's praying. That's a move, that's a motion that he would do in the Salah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whenever he prostrated Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever he's making sujood, he would place her on the ground. And then when he is going to stand up, he would pick her up again. Right? Those are moves, but not consecutive, not in the same time. And he would do that, and, 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 and that's okay. And some mothers would do that, some parents would do that, there's no problem. But you try to avoid the excessive motions while doing this or anything else. Specifically, if there's a reason like the kid, the baby is crying, for example, or he's scared, or whatever reason is that happens a lot with parents, that's okay to do this, but you avoid, again, uh, too much moving in, in the salah. Why, why moving in salah is something that is one of the invalidators? Because it actually negates the concept of the organization of the whole prayer. Salah is about you being khasha, you being very quiet, being very modest, being very humble, and you want to show humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing moves, unnecessary moves specifically, this negates the, the, the whole concept of the organization of salah. They call it nazmus salah, the organization of the salah. The organization of the acts that you are recommended to, to abide by in, in your prayer. So this is number two, excessive motions in the salah. Number three and four, eating and drinking. And that's obvious. You cannot eat or drink while you are praying. And you need to be careful even if, so obviously eating or drinking is not allowed, but if there are some sort of leftover food in your mouth, 
You need to make sure you rinse that before you pray. Because if you swallow something that is a little bit big, that is in your mouth, that invalidates your salah. I mean intentionally, of course. Unintentionally, it depends. If you really didn't take enough care of your mouth before your salah, you didn't rinse your mouth, and you know there are left, leftover food in your mouth, you didn't remove that before your prayer, maybe that's your problem. So this would invalidate your salah. Even if you swallowed that unintentionally. Even a small part, by the way. Like not, when I say like a big part, not, like not really big, something that is really small. Some scholar said it's as big as the, you know the, you know the hummus uh, beans? Like as, as the, the chickpeas? It's like as, one, as, as big as one of these. If you swallow something of that size or bigger, this invalidates your salah. That's one of, the, one of the ways they try to measure what is that food that if I, if I swallow by my prayer, that would invalidate my prayer. And again, the Dalil we said, the Prophet said, this salah, you cannot do these things. You cannot eat, you cannot drink, you cannot speak. There are a lot of hadith explain that to, to people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This number three and four, or you can count them to be only one. Number five, it's about the awrah. The exposure of one's nakedness or awrah, if it is not covered immediately. Something happens in your prayer, you, um, you figure out that your awrah is exposed. Like, part, like... Um, your, your brother is, is praying, for example, with a kind of a short pants, and then like part of his knees, for example, or above his knees were exposed, and then right away he covered it. If you do that immediately, your prayer is still okay. If that lasts for a bit, your prayer is invalid. Same thing with sisters. Something part of the aura, of the hair, of any part that has to be covered in the prayer. If you cover it immediately, your prayer is okay. If you don't, and you found out that you lasted a bit, with your awrah being exposed, you have to repeat your salah again because this invalidates your, your prayer. And the same thing you see about the occurrence of any filth that is not removed immediately from your body or from your clothes. Something falls on you, for example, while you are praying. This doesn't happen a lot, but let's just assume it happens. Something falls on your clothes or falls on your body, and once it falls on you, you just removed it. This wouldn't happen to any kind of filth, by the way. This, this would happen if the filth is dry. It's not something wet. Something wet, you cannot just remove it while you are praying, right? But something dry falls on you, just like you removed it and it didn't stick to your body or to your hands or to, 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 to your clothes, your prayer is okay. If not, you have to stop your prayer, your prayer, and then you go remove that najasa or that filth, and then you redo your salah again. You start over your salah again. Um, one of the things that invalidates the salah, specifically when you are in a jama'ah, when you are following an imam. سيد ويبطلها سبق الإمام بركنين فعليين وكذا التخلف بهما بغير عذر. It is invalidated by preceding the Imam in two essential actions. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said إنما جعل الإمام ليؤتم به. Said the Imam is appointed so that he should be followed. So bow when he bows, rise when he rises, and if he prays seated, pray seated. You do whatever the Imam is doing. So, if you precede the Imam with two actions in the Salah, you invalidate your Salah. You do not only invalidate your, your, your following of the Imam, you invalidate your own prayer too. Right? So the Imam is standing, so you, you went ahead and you made the Rukur. And then you, you, you actually uh, stood up after the Rukur. And you're going for Sujud and the Imam is still standing. Your Salah is invalid. Two essential moves, two essential uh, actions or acts of the Salah. But he said something very specific in that sentence. He said two actions. Two essential actions. Why did he say actions? Can't you like say something like... Exactly. Exactly. To exclude if you proceed the Imam in any essential saying in prayer. What if you proceed the Imam in your, in your recitation before him, for example? We do not have a lot of sayings that are as essential as Farah and the Salah. But we are not talking about the sayings, we are not talking about Surah Al-Fatiha, for example. But we are talking about the actions like Ruku'a, Sujood, standing uh, at the beginning or raising from the Ruku'a. This is, this is what we are talking about. If you proceed before the Imam, if you proceed the Imam uh, with two essential actions, this invalidates uh, your Salah. And the, other, the opposite is the same thing. And likewise, by lagging behind in two essential actions without an excuse. The man makes ruku'ah, you're still reciting. He rises up from ruku'ah, you're still reciting. He goes down for sujood, you're still reciting. Your salah is invalid. If it's only one move, by the way, this doesn't invalidate your salah. Sometimes he makes ruku'ah, you're still finishing your recitation. That's okay. 
and you are behind in one rukun or one move, that's okay. But if you're behind two moves or more, this invalidates your prayer. So again, in, in, in short, number one, speak it intentionally, even two phonemes, or unintentionally if Allah. That's number one. Number two, excessive motion in the salah. Number three, eating. Number four, drinking. Number five, exposure of one's nakedness. And number six, the occurrence of filth if it's not removed immediately. And for the awra, for the nakedness, if it's not covered immediately. And then number eight, if you proceed or you lag the imam with two essential actions. Those are the main things that invalidate one's prayer. And this last two are specifically about the jama'ah, of course. And then generally he said, وَلَا تَصِحُّ الصَّلَاةُ خَلْفَ كَافِرٍ وَمْرَأَةٍ وَخُنْثَىٰ he said, prayer is not valid behind a disbeliever. Why? Because his prayer is not valid itself. Why? Because if one of the conditions of the validity of prayer is to have taklif. And part of that taklif is to be a Muslim. To be legally responsible in Islam. And you're not legally responsible in Islam about these things, specifically the ibadah, unless you are a Muslim. So his prayer himself is not valid. So you cannot follow someone that you know his prayer is not valid. You get that point? That's the reason why. And it's obvious, of course, that you cannot actually... Follow, uh, even if he knows how to pray, even if he knows Quran, he knows everything. His, his prayer would be perfect as the, the, the actions and the arkan and the essentials and everything. But he's not a Muslim. And this is essential and a prerequisite for the prayer to be valid. So you can actually follow him in the prayer. Nor for a man behind a woman. And this is the, 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 the amr of the Prophet وسلم, when he said, No woman is too, late, is too lead than a man in prayer. And Malik ibn al Huwayrith, one of the companions, he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying, whoever visits a people is not to leave them in prayer. One of their men is to leave them. This hadith is talking about the adab of, of visiting someone, but he indicated that one of their men. That's why there is a negative implication of this, as we say. The negative implication is that he didn't actually consider that a woman can lead men in prayer. He didn't state that clearly, but one of the implications of hadith that a man has to leave the prayer if he is leading men and women, or if he is leading only men. If it's a group of women, of course, they can have jama'ah, and a woman can be an imam for that jama'ah. But if, if men and women, or only men, um, a woman cannot lead this salah. And that's a consensus among the, 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 the scholars and all the madah. Or hermaphrodite. This is one of the people that cannot lead the salah. And even if it's something that is natural, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like, uh, afflict this person with, because he was created like this, he's not allowed to, to lead the salah. He has to pray, of course, but he's not allowed to lead the salah. And there are a lot of details about this in fiqh. Because it's possible that this person to become a male or a female, we don't know if he's a male or a female. That's why there's a confusion about his situation. So if there's a confusion about his situation, you cannot lead him because we cannot decide he's a male or a female, if, if that's basically the, the case. So those are the main general impact errors of the prayer. There's eight or nine things that we counted, plus you cannot pray, uh, Everybody cannot pray behind uh, a disbeliever or a hermaphrodite, and a man cannot pray behind a woman. And then he moved to talk about al Jumu'ah. Again, we said before this book is very summarized, it's very uh, abridged from a larger books of fiqh. So that's why we're going only over the main essential points. Please try to keep all the questions, and we have all the questions at the end, inshallah. So Friday and congregational prayers, al Jumu'ah. Jumu'atu fardu ayin ala kulli muslimin dhakarin hurrin hadrin bila udrin shar'iyin kal maradi wal matar. So the Friday prayer is a personal obligation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayuha al-ladhina amanu, idha nudiya lil-salati min yawm al-jumu'ati, fas'au ila dhikri allahi wa daru al-bayt. So you have believed, when the call is heard for the prayer of the day of congregation, haste unto remembrance of Allah, and leave your trading, your trading that is better for you, if you did but no. And the Prophet ﷺ said on the planks of his pulpit, وسلم, people are to seize missing Friday prayers or Allah will seal their hearts. And then they will be among the, the negligent. One of the implications of prohibition in Islam is when there is a threat about something. When you find a text in Quran or Sunnah that is a, there is a threat or a clear punishment of doing something, that's an enough implication that the doing of this thing is haram. Even if the hadith doesn't say clearly, do not do this. So again, how can we know if something is prohibited? If number one, the clearest way is that do not do this. La taf'al, do not do something. Or it can be implied when there is a punishment that is being prescribed for this. 
or there was a clear threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Messenger وسلم, that says, if you do so and so, this punishment will happen to you. Like this hadith. But that's not the only dalil or evidence that Friday prayer is obligatory. This is one of the evidences for this. So there are conditions of obligations of Salat al Jumu'ah. There are only people with certain conditions and, and characteristics that are required to pray Salat al Jumu'ah. So he said, upon every Muslim male who is free, resident, and lacks a legal excuse which, or such as sickness or severe rape. The Prophet وسلم, said, Friday prayer is an obligatory duty upon every Muslim in congregation except for four, own slaves, women, youth, and the sick. A male that excludes the female, she can pray Salat al-Jumu'ah if she wants, but she is not obligated to do it. But of course, she has to pray Salat al-Dhuhr. So she's allowed to skip Salat al-Jumu'ah, but she has to pray Salat al-Dhuhr. She cannot skip both. If she prays Salat al-Jumu'ah, she doesn't have to pray Salat al-Dhuhr. Because that works for Salat al-Jumu'ah, for, for, for Salat al-Dhuhr, or that stands for Salat al-Dhuhr. So this is the first condition. A male, he has to pray Salat al-Jumu'ah. He doesn't have any excuse to skip Salat al-Jumu'ah except these ones that he mentioned. Free person, back in the days when they used to have slaves, a slave wasn't actually obligated to, pr to pray Salat al-Jumu'ah to make things easier for him. Because he's owned by other people. A resident to exclude someone who's traveling. If you are traveling, is if, you're, if you are from out of town, you do not have to pray Salat al-Jumu'ah. What is the, 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 the definition of a traveler in that fiqh sense? If you are in a city other than your hometown or the city that you are living in, that's number one. Number two, you're not planning to stay in the city for over four days. Any city you visit, you're staying for over four days, you're not traveling. Maybe culturally or in our thinking you are, you say, I'm traveling, but in the fiqh sense, you're not. So you cannot skip Salat al-Jumu'ah. If you, if you travel somewhere, you plan to stay there for like one week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever the number of days, you cannot skip Salat al-Jumu'ah. You still have to pray Salat al-Jumu'ah. Yes, you're not one of the residents of this city, but you have to pray Salat al-Jumu'ah. So this is the meaning of resident in, in, in the conditions of Salat al-Jumu'ah. And if you do not have an excuse, like sickness, somebody who's sick, you cannot attend Salat al-Jumu'ah, specifically that Salat al-Jumu'ah is actually longer in time, that needs at least like 30 minutes, and he cannot sit in the mosque for 30 minutes, this person is actually exempted from the obligations of Salat al-Jumu'ah. Or there is a severe rain, or a very severe storm that it's a kind of risky to go to the masjid to pray Salat al-Jumu'ah, this is also one of the excuses that you can skip Salat al-Jumu'ah. Then how to perform Salat al-Jumu'ah, he talked about the conditions of the khutbah. What are the, 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 the essentials or the obligations of the khutbah, the sermons of Salat al-Jumu'ah? Said, وَمِن شُرُوتِ الْجُمُعَةِ خُطْبَةَ الْخُطْبَةَانِ Number one, it has to be two sermons. If you notice, and if you pray Salat al-Jumu'ah, you notice that the Imam talks for a bit, and then he sits down for a very short break, and then he resumes after that. Those are two different sermons. Having two sermons in Salat al-Jumu'ah is something obligatory that you have to perform. I mean, the khatib has to perform. If he doesn't, it's not considered a Salat al-Jumu'ah. So he invalidates, he invalidates his own prayer and people's prayer as well. There is some other khatilat about this with other schools, but most of the schools are actually holding this opinion that you have to have two sermons in Salat al-Jumu'ah. And then these two sermons, there are five things that you have to make sure they are mentioned in the khutbah. Said, وَأَرْكَانُهُمَا Both of them, both the two sermons. Alhamdulillahi ta'ala, it's number one. وَالصَّلَاةُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ Number two. وَالْوَصِيَّةُ بِالتَّقْوَى Three. وَقِرَاءَةُ آيَةٍ مِّنَ الْقُرْآنِ مُفْهِمَةٍ أو مُفْهِمَةٌ فِي إِحْدَاهُمَا وَالدُّعَاءُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ the essential elements include, number one, praising Allah. You have to, in any form, you have to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like saying, alhamdulillah. If you just say, alhamdulillah, you, you're done with this essential. Prayers upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa salatu ala rasulillah. That's essential. That's something that you have to do in your khutbah. Number three, advising to be mindful of Allah. Specifically with taqwa. Say, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, taqullah. Be mindful of Allah. Fear Allah. All, everything that leads to the same meaning, you have to do that in your prayer. And this has to happen in both sermons. So when a khatib stands up for the second sermon, he has to say alhamdulillah, or any, any other phrase that delivers the same meaning, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, ittaqullah, or fear Allah, or be mindful of Allah. He has to repeat these three things in the second khutbah. And then at least in one of two sermons, he has to recite one ayah from the Quran. And one ayah, like one full ayah, doesn't have to be a full ayah, but one ayah that gives it like a full meaning. That's why he said, uh, mufhima. Reciting a coherent verse of the Quran. And one of them, if he does it only in one sermon, that's enough. And then the last one, in the second sermon of the prayer, he has to make dua for the believers, for Muslims. 
and supplication for the believers in the second one. So three out of the five you have to do as a khatib in both of them. And then one of them, which is the Qur'an, in one of them you pick, you recite one ayah from the Qur'an. And then in the second one, which most of the time happens at the end of the prayer or at the end of the khutbah before praying, you make dua for Muslims. A dua lil mu'minina fil akhirati. And then for, for the khatib, for the person who delivers the khutbah, it is obligatory to deliver it while standing. He cannot be sitting down and giving the khutbah. And having a ritual purity, he has to have tahara while he is delivering the khutbah. With one's nakedness covered, and he has to make sure that his aura is covered. It's almost like salah. He has to be standing, he has to cover his aura, and he has to have wudu. It's, this, this is the way the Prophet used to give the khutbah. One of the companions of the Prophet, his name is Jabir ibn Samura. Radiallahu he said the Prophet would deliver the sermon while standing, then sit, and then stand, and deliver the sermon while standing. And now he's talking about the two sermons in the prayer. He said, whoever informed you that he would deliver the sermon seated has light. He's, he's emphasizing that nobody ever of us saw the Prophet ﷺ giving the khutbah while sitting down. He said, I by Allah, he's making an oath. I prayed with him, sallallahu alayhi wa more than 2,000 prayers. He wanted to, to, to give the, the, the implication that I know him very well. I know how he used to pray, sallallahu alayhi wa By the way, 2,000 prayers, he doesn't mean the Jumu'ah, because that might not be really the case that he prayed 2,000 Friday prayers. He means 2,000 prayers in general, that include Jum'ah and, and, and other prayers in, in, in general. So this is the style of the khutbah that was reported by a lot of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, that he would do the khutbah uh, in this way. Some of these things are a matter of disagreement among the scholars just to know. Some other madhahib, they said, not really all these five things that have to be in every single khutbah. Some of them are like standing, tahara, these things are very common among a lot of madhahib. But about the five different essentials of the khutbah, there is a kind of ikhtilaf among the scholars about these things. But Shafi'i school and the Hanbali school, they say you have to make sure these five essentials of the khutbah that he mentioned have to be performed by the, the, the khatib. And then it is obligatory also to sit between them. So he gives the first khutbah and then he sits down for a very short break and then he resumes the second khutbah. How long he should be sitting? He said longer than the repose during prayer. We talked about the tumanina last time. Right? Say, so, and when you make a ruku'ah, when you make a zuhud, when you stand up, there is that. Uh, repose that you have to have in your prayer. We call it the Tuma'anina. So the minimum of this is Subhanallah. Right? As long in terms of time as saying Subhanallah. In the khutbah between the two sermons, a little bit longer than this. Which is basically a few seconds and then the Imam continues giving the, the second khutbah. And for there to be consecutiveness between the two sermons and between the sermons and the prayer. You cannot have a long break between the two khutbahs. And you cannot have a long break between the two khutbahs and the prayer. It has to be right after the khutbah. So if the Imam finishes the khutbah, you cannot have like five, ten minutes break before praying. You cannot have that. You have to pray right away. If he sits down in, after the first sermon, he has to make it short. He cannot stay for a long time before giving the second sermon. The muwala, the consecutiveness, is a condition for the validity of, the, of Salat al-Jumu'ah. And then Salat al-Jama'ati. He finished talking about Salat al-Jumu'ah. He said, wa Salat al-Jama'ati, wa Salat al-Janazati, fardu kifayati. He talked about two other kinds of prayer. He said, congregational prayer, other than Salat al-Jumu'ah, other than Friday prayer, and the funeral prayer are, com are community obligations. There is ikhtilaf about Salat al-Jama'ah among the scholars. Some of them said it's a communal obligation. Some of them said it's highly recommended to pray in, in a congregation as a Jama'ah. Uh, and some of them said it actually could be a personal obligation if you do not have an excuse. This among the, the, the different schools of thought in general. Praying the five daily prayers, generally it's a communal obligation. Every community has to offer Salat al-Jama'ah. And a Muslim is highly recommended to pray Salat al-Jama'ah. And here we're talking about two different meanings of Salat al-Jama'ah. Salat al-Jama'ah in general, that includes praying at the mosque or anywhere else, is highly recommended or communal obligation upon both males and females. Praying it in the mosque, it's much more highly recommended for men than, than women. There are two different things. So the, uh, the congregation prayer is not only for men, it's also for women. So if a woman has the chance to pray by herself, to pray in a jama'ah with men or with other women, it's better for her, it's a more reward. So the hadith that says that salat al-jama'ah is better than salat al-fard in 27 degrees, that includes both men and women. But speaking about the mosque specifically, it's about men. It's much more highly recommended for men to pray at the mosque and they get more thawab by doing this. It's recommended for the sisters to pray at the mosque too, but not as much as the women. As, as, the, the, the men. So when we say the general hukum of congregation prayer, we're not only talking about the mosque. Sometimes we, we, we relate 
or we limit the meaning of Salat al-Jama'ah to be only in the mosque. Salat al-Jama'ah in general is committed. And then you get more thawab if you do it in the mosque because it's the, the, the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ said prayer in a congregation is 27 times superior to prayer offered by an individual. Salat al-Jama'ati tafdulu ala salat al-Fardi bi 27 darajat. He also said, وسلم, and this hadith implies the concept of the communal obligation. He said, if there are three men, three men in a village or in the desert, among whom prayer is not offered in congregation, or in another narration, he said, in a, a prayer, save that the devil has mastery over them. So they said that means when he said three men, that means it's not a personal obligation, but it means it's a communal obligation. If there's a group of Muslims living anywhere, they have to make sure that Salat al-Jama'ah has been offered. This is the, 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 the meaning of this hadith. This is for Salat al-Jama'ah in general. And then he also mentioned Salat al-Janazah, the funeral prayer, to be an example of communal obligation. Not only the, the funeral prayer, all the funeral services are communal obligations, and we mentioned this before. Washing, shrouding, praying over and burying the deceased are by consensus communal obligations according to all these scholars. These are the salawats. So he talked about the obligatory prayers, Salat al-Jum'ah, the communal obligation or communal obligatory prayers, and now he will talk about the recommended prayers. Now you can, you can see the order that the, the author is going with. He said, وَالْعِيدَانِ وَالْكُسُوفَانِ وَالْوِتْرُ سُنَنٌ مُؤَكَّدَاتٌ وَكَذَا رَوَاتِبُ الصَّلَاةِ These are five different kinds of recommended prayers. Number one, the Eid prayer. See, the Eid prayers. We have two Eids, right? Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. The one that comes right after Ramadan and the one that comes during the, uh, the Hajj season. How do you pray Eid? In short, we pray Eid, number one, two rak'ah. It's two cycles, prayer. And during the first one, you make takbirat seven times, other than the takbirah of Ihra. You say Allahu Akbar, that's the opening takbirah of Eid. And then you count seven times Allahu Akbar. Okay? And then you start with the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha and then the short surah afterwards. For the second rak'ah, you, you make five takbirat other than the takbirah of standing after the first rak'ah. Right? So seven plus one, five plus one. So basically they're eight and six. So seven takbirah in the first one and, the, and five takbirahs in, in, in the second one. That was the, the style of prayer the Prophet ﷺ used to pray. And then after the two rak'ahs, now a khutbah has to be delivered. So the khutbah is after the prayer, which is the opposite of salat and jum'ah. Jum'ah is the opposite. But salat al-Eid, it's actually the, the khutbah, the, the, the prayer is before the khutbah. In the khutbah, when the imam starts, by the way, the seven takbiras and the five takbiras are not must. If you miss them, your prayer is still okay. But you miss the sunnah. So they're not one of the part of the applications of the salat. But you're recommended to do them because it's, it's the, the, the sign of, of, of happiness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually commanded Muslims to show in the Eid prayer. This is, this is the concept of Eid prayer, basically. It's not only two rak'ahs. The, the unique thing about Eid prayer is the takbir. And that's the sign of, of an Eid occasion in general. When the Imam starts giving the khutbah, it's, uh, generally khutbah al-Eid is exactly the same style of khutbah al-Jum'ah. Sermon of Eid is always the same as sermon of, the, of Friday prayer. But at the beginning of the first sermon, the Imam is recommended to say Allahu Akbar nine times as an opening of his khutbah. If he doesn't do that, that's okay. But before giving or delivering the khutbah that he wants to talk about, he would start the khutbah with saying Allahu Akbar uh, nine times. And then in the second khutbah, because it's the same style as we said, so he gives the first khutbah, then he sits for a few seconds, and then he resumes for the second sermon. He says Allahu Akbar at the beginning of the second one, seven times. Nine of the first one, seven in the second one. That, that was reported from the, the son of the Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That, that's, this, that was the way of the Salah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is for, for Salat al-Eid in general. He also mentioned Salat al-Kusuf. That includes a Kusufan that includes the Kusuf and Khusuf in Arabic language. We see the eclipse prayers that includes for the sun and for the moon. Lunar eclipse or solar eclipse. The Khusuf or Kusuf prayer, the eclipse prayers are a little bit different. They're a little bit unique. Maybe we're not really used to them because it doesn't happen that often and maybe a lot of people don't know exactly the way the eclipse prayer should be offered. So number one, it's two prayer, it's two cycles prayer, two rak'ahs. That's like a lot of other sunan. But the unique thing about salat al-kusuf al khusuf or the eclipse prayers is that you have two ruku' in each rak'ah. So you recite, you make one ruku', you stand up, you recite again, and then you make another ruku', and then you stand up, and then you go, you, you recite again, and then you go for sujood. 
this is this is the unique thing about Salat al-Kusuf. Again, you start and you recite, and it's, it's it generally ha should be long salah because this is the way the Prophet offered it. And then you make a ruku' and you make your ruku' very long. That was the sunnah. You didn't have to, but that was the sunnah. You make it long. And then you stand up and then you recite again. And then you make the second ruku' and then you stand up and then you go for sujood. This is, this is generally the, the style of, of salat, al, the two eclipse prayers. It's very recommended to make the recitation very long and it's very recommended to make the ruku' very long with saying subhanAllah. Why? Because you're submitting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in, in showing your gratitude that all these natural phenomena are only done by Allah. That was the lesson the Prophet ﷺ taught the Sahaba or the companions of, of the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa said in the Quran, لَا تَسْجُدُوا لِلشَّمْسِ وَلَا لِلْقَمَرِ وَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ He said, do not prostrate to the sun or the moon, but prostrate to Allah who created them. وَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُنَّ so there is a aqidah lesson behind this prayer. It's a very beautiful prayer. You, you show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all these different phenomena that we observe, they're very magnificent. But we believe that you're the only one who controls all these things. When that happened, when the son of the Prophet ﷺ passed away, people thought, because you know a lot of people have these sometimes strange conceptions about some natural phenomena. People thought that the sun is sad for Ibrahim. When the eclipse happened, the same day that Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet ﷺ passed away, so the sun, there was a sun, like a solar eclipse. And people thought because it's sad for Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet. So the Prophet told him, no, that's not the case. The, the lunar or solar eclipse do not happen for the death or the life of someone. They're just signs of Allah. This is the way a Muslim should believe in this, in this natural phenomenon. And that was the day that this prayer was legislated on Allah and the Prophet taught the companions how to offer Salat uh, al-Kusuf or the eclipse prayers and this is that we mentioned. Again, you start your prayer, recite Surah Al-Fatiha and then you recite a long Surah. The Prophet used to recite Baqarah and Ibn al-Nisa, those long chapters in the Raka'ah. Then you make Ruku'ah and, and I mean in the, in the total of all the two Raka'ahs. You make Ruku'ah and then you stand up and you recite again. And then you make another Ruku'ah and then you make the Sujood. If it's a solar eclipse, you do not recite out loud. Right? Because it's during the day. Most of the prayers during the day, you do not recite out loud. There are very few exceptions of a prayer during the day that you actually have jahar in the prayer. Like what? Jum'ah. What else? Janazah. No, Janazah is a secret. Eid. Eid, yes. Jum'ah and Eid. That's during the day, and you recite out loud. But generally, day prayer, you do not recite out loud. Night prayer, you recite out loud. So the same thing with the lunar eclipse, you recite out loud. If it's a solar one, you recite just kind of secretly. So th this is about the, the, the eclipse prayers. And then the witr prayers, number three of the recommended prayers. Salat al witr and it's a very highly recommended. And if you remember, maybe I mentioned last time that some of the scholars said it's a wajib, it's a mandatory. Not in the sense of the other five obligatory prayers, but it's really wajib that you get sense if you miss it. Not this school of thought, it's the Hanafi school of thought, but this is how important Salat al-Witr is. The minimum number of rak'ahs or cycles that you have to offer for Salat al-Witr is one. And the minimum complete form is three. There is minimum and there is minimum complete form. This, this is one of the concepts about the sunnah. He said aqal and then he said aqal al kamal. This is, this is fiqhi terminologies. There is the minimum is one. The minimum complete one is three, which, is, which means a little bit better. This is the best of the minimum, basically. It's three times. It's three, three, three rak'ahs. And the, the, the upper limit, the maximum, is 11 rak'ah. So one, and the per minimum is three in terms of the fadl, or 11. But you can have any odd numbers, too. So it could be one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. 11. It could be any of those. Minimum is one, maximum is 11. The best of the minimum is three. This is the way, this is the way uh, Salat al water is. The Prophet said, whoever wishes to perform water prayer with one prayer cycle is to do it. So he said, could be one rak'ah. He also would pray وسلم, 11 prayer cycles at night, making them odd water with one prayer cycle. So that's the dalil for the minimum and that's the dalil for, for, for the maximum. He also said, وسلم, another hadith, water prayer is a duty. Anyone who wishes to observe it with five prayer cycles is to do so. And whoever wishes to observe it with three is to do so. And whoever wishes to observe it with one is to do so. so that was another dalil of having in any uh, odd number. 
There are a lot of different ways of praying Salat al that you people usually get confused. And a lot of these questions actually come up during Ramadan that is coming soon. Now, how to pray Salat al how many rak'ahs? A lot of different ways of, of performing it. A lot of these ways are correct. A lot of the ways that you know of, a lot of them at least, they're correct. Because there are really multiple ways of doing them. Some scholars prefer separating them. Some scholars prefer having them all at once. Some scholars prefer that you have one tashahus. Some scholars prefer you have two tashahus. It's not only preference, they're all reported from the Prophet. So there are multiple ways of, of performing salat al al Of course, if it's one, just one rak'ah. If it's long, like 11, you can actually pray all of them at once until the 10th. And then you make salam, and then you have the last one just by itself. If you want to do them nine, you do eight, uh, one shot, and then you do the, the ninth. Or you do sixth, and then you do the seventh. Or you do uh, four, and you do the fifth. You can do that. Some people pray them like separately every two rak'ah with salam. But that's not maybe the better way. Because the better way is to have them, if you want to pray what's like seven, six, and then one. Four and five. And then the fifth, I mean. Or eight and then the ninth one. This is, this is one of the, of the recommended ways of, of praying Salat al uh, The Prophet ﷺ uh, was asked by one of his companions, this is the dalil that it's only highly recommended Salat al -Watr. He asked him, am I required to perform other than the five prayers? And he said, Sallallahu no, not unless you volunteer. Illa an So that was the evidence for a lot of scholars who said it's not obligatory, but it's actually highly recommended to to perform Salat al watr So he said, all of these salawat that he mentioned now are all emphatically recommended, like highly recommended by Islam. So are the non-obligatory prayers associated with the obligatory prayers. So if you remember at the beginning, he mentioned Eid prayers, Klebs prayers, Watr. They're, all of them are highly recommended. And then he said, also rawatib al salat the, uh, the prayers that are associated with the obligatory prayers. We categorize them into two different categories. First one is the highly recommended rawatib. Again, the word rawatib means prayers associated with the five daily prayers. The first category is the highly recommended one, mu'akkadah, the very emphasized ones. The second category is the less in terms of emphasis. The first one, if you want to take the per minimum of, of, the, of the highly recommended ones. When you say highly recommended, that means the Prophet ﷺ barely left them. He would do them er almost every single day of his life. It's still sunnah, but he rarely would live praying these prayers. The R10, the, the, the well emphasized or the very highly recommended ones. Two before Salat al-Fajr, two before Salat al-Dhuhr, and two after Salat al-Dhuhr, two after Salat al-Maghrib, and two after Salat al-Aisha. Those are the ten ones that are really highly recommended to pray. If you want to make them more, to include the highly recommended and the other ones, the two categories together, so it would be two before Salat al-Fajr, four before Salat al-Dhuhr, four after Salat al-Dhuhr, four before Salat al-Asr, two after Salat al-Maghrib, and two after Salat al-Aisha. So this is, this is the difference between the, 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 the very mu'akkad, the very emphasized prayers associated to the five prayers or the other ones that are not really highly recommended. And there are a lot of hadith also from the Prophet wasallam that were reported about this. He also mentioned Salat al-Duha, the mid-morning prayer. And the Taraweeh are recommended prayers which have enormous reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salat al-Duha, you pray it a little bit after the sunrise. Some people try to measure that with like 15, 20 minutes after the sunrise. Now you can, the time of Salat al-Duha of Salat al -Duha starts. Before the, uh, after the sun rises and before it reaches its zenith. So like, let's say 20 minutes to be safe after the sunrise until 20 minutes before Dhuhr time. During that time, this is the time of Salat al-Duha. The minimum is two rak'ahs. And the maximum is eight rak'ahs for Salat al-Duha. You can pray at, you can pray Salat al-Duha actually over two rak'ahs as well. Um, it's, there's a lot of thawab for Salat al-Duha. It's what, the, the hadith about the fadl and the reward of Salat al-Duha is really beautiful from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sayyidina Abu Huraira, he said, my dear friend, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Khalili, that's one of the beautiful words about companionship. He said, advised with three things. Advised Abu Huraira with three things. He said, uh, to fast three days every month. You know that sunnah of fasting, and we'll talk about fasting inshallah. To pray, number two, to pray two prayer cycles of the mid-morning prayer. And number three, and to pray water before sleeping. Try not to skip any of these three sunnah. 
Because the, the, he said, Awsani Khalili Bithalat. He said, This is the, the advice the Prophet وسلم, gave me. Uh, on the day of the conquest of Mecca, Fath Mecca, the Prophet وسلم, prayed the mid morning prayer as eight prayer cycles, saying, Assalamu alaikum between each two cycles. This is what he did. And this is the dalil of Salat al Duha to be eight rak'ahs of the Prophet. And this is a, like a supportive evidence of the performance of Salat al Duha. He also mentioned Salat al-Taraweeh, the Taraweeh prayer is performed each night during the Ramadan. And it's important to talk about Taraweeh since Ramadan is in like four weeks from now. Uh, because the fadl and the reward of Salat al-Taraweeh is very big in Ramadan. The time of Salat al-Taraweeh starts after Salat al-Isha, between Isha and Fajr. Because it's basically Qiyam al but with a specific way that was associated with the month of Ramadan. It's it should be performed two rak'ahs. You cannot just perform four or six rak'ah in a row. You have to separate between each two rak'ah. It's two cycles. You separate by by salam alaykum, by salam, and then you continue praying salat al taraweeh. It's sunnah to have a short rest after each four rak'ah. That's why it's called taraweeh. Taraweeh means part of the meaning is the rest, the rest in time the companions would have after each four rak'ahs. Because you used to pray at 20 rak'ahs. This is the sunnah of Umar ibn al Khattab. This is the, 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 the opinion of the four schools of thought. Is that the Salat al is 20 rak'ah. If you pray less, there's, there's no problem. But this is the, 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 the actual number of rak'ahs for Salat al Two by two. You do not pray more than two rak'ahs uh, in a row. And the time starts between Salat al Isha and Salat al Fajr. The Prophet وسلم, said, whoever establishes prayers during the nights of Ramadan faithfully, out of conviction and sincerity, all his past sins will be forgiven. Man qama Ramadan imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu. And we said the number of salat, the number of, uh, of rak'ahs of salat of taraweeh is actually 20 rak'ahs. All these recommended prayers that he mentioned, there is another categorization that we can apply to them. Some scholars would categorize these prayers to be a section that is jama'ah is recommended for and a section that individual prayer is recommended for. Right? Some of these prayers are recommended to be prayed in jama'ah. Some of them are recommended to be prayed in, in, in individual. So for example, what is the prayer that is recommended to be in a jama'ah or that be an individual? Taraweeh. Taraweeh? No, first, first. Oh, it's called. Okay. Obligatory prayers. No, no we'll talk about the sunnah. We'll talk about the, the recommended prayers. Taraweeh, actually, there is, there is a detailed discussion about it. That generally, yes, jama'ah is better. But some people said sometimes it would be better for some individual. If he, if he knows that he has the, 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 the himma, he has the, the zeal and the power to perform salat al tarawih every night and to perform it fully and maybe in a better way than he can be prayed with a jama'ah. For that person, if he prefers to pray by himself, it, it will be better for himself. If he knows that if he stays home, he's not going to pray, he's going to just waste time, he's going to do whatever. No, so for that person, it's better for him to pray salat al tarawih in a jama'ah. So salat al is an example. What else? Salat al Eid prayer. But by the way, it's recommended to be in a jama'ah, but you can pray by yourself. You can pray by yourself. Without a khutbah, of course, but you can you can pray by yourself. And if you miss Salatul Eid, it's to make it up. If you just uh, slept in and you couldn't make it, you can you should pray the Torah after Salatul Eid. Yes. Salatul Janaz. Salatul Janaz is is a, is a communal obligation, and it's in a jama'ah. We we try to count the recommended prayers. Eclipse prayers. It's better in a jama'ah. Jama'ah. Jum'a? Yeah, but Jum'ah is a fard. It has to be in Jum'ah. Has to be. We're, we're counting again. We're counting the recommended prayers from that sense. A part or a section that is recommended to be in a jama'ah over being individual, and the other part will be the rest. So it's, it's, it's mostly all what you said plus salat al When people are in drought, the drought prayer, they call it. And you want to make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is a salah. He didn't mention that here, it has a specific way of doing it in terms of the khutbah. It's two rak'ahs and a khutbah. Close with the eight prayer, but in a different style in terms of the khutbah and what the Imam should say and that stuff. But he didn't mention it here. The rest of the prayers, you are recommended to make them in individually, like water, duha. That the prayers associated with the other prayers, uh, with the other obligatory prayers, all these prayers, you do them individually. The prayers, the other ones that we counted at the beginning, like Eid, Istisqa, Kusuf, Klefs prayers, Eid prayers, Drought prayers, all these prayers, you are highly recommended to perform them in, in a jama'ah. Um, the next chapter is the fasting, but let's, let's open the floor for some questions before moving to a new topic. We have only one time. One more lecture to cover the fiqh part, and then we'll have two lectures left in that course to cover the tazkiyah part, and we finish it before Ramadan, inshallah.
So you have to make sure that next time we finish the, the fiqh part. I think I said before that we're only going to cover fasting chapter and the zakat chapter. We're not going to talk about hajj because it's a long chapter. Maybe it's irrelevant to the reason or the purpose of this course. And for the sake of time, we cannot cover it. So we'll focus much more on fasting. And that's a good coincidence that Ramadan is just coming. So it will be good to, to, to learn and to study the chapter fasting. We'll take zakat in a little bit summary. And then we're going to skip hajj and we'll move to the, the spirituality part, inshallah. So we'll take some questions about the prayer. Yes. You mentioned the invalidities of salah. Having a filth uh, on you, does that include a stain, for example, olive oil or uh, like food stain? Is that no, that's not filth. Filth, I mean adjust. Okay, adjust. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. So somebody came and praying and they said, ah, oh. what would that count for? Uh, he said intentionally or unintentionally? I guess if he's um, doing a bowing and then something hurt and said, ah. Oh. Okay, so two, two scenarios here. If he says it unintentionally, there's no problem. If he says it intentionally, if, yeah, if it's intentionally, yes, exactly. And two letters were clearly coming out of this sound, yes, that invalidates his salam. Yes. So what doesn't count as kalam is, uh, like, if you're coughing, for example, or if you're clearing your throat, and a lot of us do that, <clears throat> this, this sound that we do all the time while we're praying, this doesn't evaluate your salah. But sometimes if you intentionally do it and there are two letters or more can clearly be understood from this. I mean, we say the two letters is just the way that you can like check the validity of your prayer, basically. If that happens, this yes, that, yeah, then yes, that invalidates the prayer. Yes. So what do we call it? I have a question about laughing. I heard once of you like, it's okay, smiling is makruh, but if you can't help it, okay. But what if, let's say, a breath comes out? Or like a smile, you laugh slightly. Because something funny happens on Saturday or something. How does that, does that mean one involve the prayer? Or what's okay. the problem? So two things here. So ask about laughing and smiling. Smiling doesn't invalidate the prayer, in general. It's makruh for no reason, of course. The Prophet ﷺ smiled in his prayer. Because once he was praying and one of the angels, he said, one of the angels, he saw one of the angels, was Mikael. And he saw him, he said, he smiled to me and then I smiled back to him. But that was for a reason, of course. You're not committed to smile for no reason in the prayer. About laughing, it's the same thing. If a person laughs intentionally, of course, this is very disliked to happen in the prayer. And then it's the same rule that I said here. If two letters come out from this laugh, yes, his salah is invalid. Two letters, does that include like a breath? Like no, letters? no, two letters, two actual letters. Oh. If they come out from the laugh, this invalidates the salah. Some other madhab, one of the interesting opinions of the madhab, like the Hanafi school, they actually say that his wudu is broken too. It's the only method I said that I said that if you laugh, you should seriously laugh in your prayer. The, a lot of scholars said that might invalidate your salah, especially about the literal thing. And they said, and you have to make wudu again. And we have another hadith. We have a hadith as a date for this, but the other madhab said it's, uh, it's not an authentic hadith. Um, this is kind of ridiculous, but um, if you sneeze, for example, like you're saying, like, you know, like or if somebody sneezes and you say, like, you're hungry, you laugh about does that break your. You, you, you said to someone else, like, unintentionally. Like unintentionally, it's okay. okay. But if it's intentionally, no, that, 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 but you cannot respond to someone who's alive. Uh, somebody who would pray in a long prayer and then they would utter the word of from the duration of the salah. Intentionally offer two letters that invalid this is prayer. Yes. Yes. Uh, like sometimes you're, you're praying and then your mom calls you like, and like you, you go for like or something and you go like a mall up indicate that you pray. Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's the other way around. Usually mothers do that, right? Yeah. So it's the same thing about when I said about the recitation of implying something to a person. If a person says it mainly because it's part of his prayer, and then he had a combined intention of telling someone something, that's okay. But if he's saying it only to talk to someone or to tell someone something, no. That's not right. Because like sometimes I heard that if your mom calls upon you while you're praying, you can break your prayer. Like, you can what? You can like break your prayer and go. Yes, if, if it's salah is not obligatory, yes. That's a different thing. So if, if, if a person is being called by his parents in a not obligatory prayer, he is actually recommended to in general. But some scholars said he's recommended to this if he knows they will be upset if he doesn't answer them. But if you know that she doesn't know that I'm praying, or he doesn't know that I'm praying, and he will be okay knowing me praying, do not stop in prayer. So people don't take that literally. Right? You take it if the, 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 the hadith about this was actually said about a person who knows that his parents might be upset because he doesn't answer them. They're very sensitive, whatever the reason is. Yes, you break your salat, non obligatory prayer, and you respond to your parents. If you know that they're not going to be upset with that, that's okay. Yes? The hukm of salat al-Aid, the is the same as the Jumu'ah, because I see a lot of people in the 
Generally, okay, so both are sunnah. The prayer is sunnah and the khutbah is sunnah. But if you, if you perform it, you attend it, you have to abide by the rules of salah. Right? You don't have to talk. Yeah, yeah, you shouldn't. Yeah, no, no one is, should talk about salah. If you want to talk, he can leave and talk outside. If he leaves, that's okay. He misses tawab of attending the khutbah, but he's okay. And his prayer is okay. Yes. Yeah, in the back. No, before before praying. Before, before praying. praying, yes. After Adan, after, after, after the time, after possible. the yes. yes. I thought we were not allowed to pray anything. Uh, you thought what? We're not allowed to pray anything before, uh, between Asr and Maghrib. There is no after Asr. I said only before Asr. Before, before so before you praying after Asr. After you pray You're not allowed to pray after you pray Salat Asr. Okay. Not after the Asr time comes. Yes. yes. Yeah. Once, so about the Karaha time, once you finish praying Asr, you're not recommended to pray any other Salah until the Maghrib time comes. That's in general. There are exceptions. That's in general. Yes. Take care of you. Yes. Okay. When I'm praying, like, snitch, should I pray like you, 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 you Generally, you shouldn't, but if you say it, that's okay. Yeah, actually, so two questions. The one, so usually Friday, because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying, you know, there's Allah Alam, I'm sad it's Tijabu between the Asr and the Maghrib. So you say it's recommended to pray between Asr and the Maghrib, like the Rakaz and make dua and stuff. No, that's not, no, it's not recommended. No, it's, you can make dua, of course, but it's not recommended to pray. Like a couple of Rakaz in between? No. Because there is no reason for that. For the Karaha time, that's another topic, but you can pray if there is a reason to pray. A reason to pray, like. Uh, th there was a janaza that was on, for example. You enter the masjid and there's a sunnah that you pray tahiyyatul masjid. There is the, pr the greeting prayer for the mosque. Once you enter the mosque, it's a sunnah to pray to rakat. If you enter the mosque and it's one of these times that you're not recommended to pray, like after asr, for example, you're okay to pray with this name. This is an exception. That you can pray to rakat sunnah greeting the mosque when you enter after salatul asr. That's, uh, that's one of the exceptions. Yes. So if you miss uh, two rakat of sunnah, there will be and four rakat of sunnah during if you, if you miss to rakah before Fajr, yeah, because if the part is going on, so you join the Jama'ah. I, I don't understand. Fals. Again, can you, can, you, can you repeat the question? So, if you miss the Sunnah because of the joining the Fals Jama'ah, mm -hmm. then can I do it afterward? Or? Number one, yes, you can, but number one, yeah. you. You can still pray it before you do the jama. Yeah. Why? Why would you miss it because of the jama? But, but the jama is going on. Talk, okay, so you talking about the jama, the, the sunnah after the yeah. duhr? Yeah. Yes, you can do it after asr. Yeah. yeah. So he's asking if you pray, okay, I'm combining duhr and asr. So you pray sunnah before us. I talked about the one before. So you pray sunnah before duhr, then you combine, and if you want to pray afterwards as a sunnah for duhr, yes, you can do that. Yeah. What about fajr? What about it? There's no jama and fajr. No. But, but, but making up during the jama'ah, yes. not jama'ah, it's the entering during the jama'ah, so he have to... No, no, the first question was about combining two prayers, right? Okay, now that's another, another question. If you enter the masjid, if you go into the masjid for Salat al-Fajr, for example, yeah. you walk in and you pray already, yeah. you miss the sunnah, yeah. you can make it up afterwards. Generally, you can make up the recommended prayers, by the way. Even if you enter Salat al-Dhuhr, after you finish Salat al-Dhuhr, you want to make up the four rak'ahs of before, before yeah. you can make them up and then you pray the four after, or the two and two. The way you want to pray. You can make up the recommended prayers in, in general. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes, in terms of motion, moving, sometimes people stand and they just weigh their body. Like that. That's what do you mean, weigh their body? There are people when they, when they do salat, they kind of. Yeah. Kind of These should be careful with these moves in general. But if it happens unintentionally, that's okay. That person tries as much as he can to be very quiet and very steady when he's praying. Yes. Can we go back to like the not running back to prayer? So let's say I'm having a bad day and I have time between us and some of I just want to go pray. Like the intention is to pray to get in and then like the put up on the back. That's not mm, That's not recommended because the, the, the Prophet said people shouldn't pray in this time. It's really disliked. Except he said it in some hadith said except for a reason. And the reason we said like reading prayer, like funeral prayer, these are exceptions. But generally if just I'm praying just two rak'ahs, nafil mutlaq we call it. No. But you can wait and pray after Maghrib. 
the longest time you're not committed to praying is between Asr and Maghrib. That's the longest one. The rest of the times are not really that long. So you can pray after Maghrib, you can pray after Isha, and it's more thawab. Yes? I have questions about the Hayat Masjid. Like here in Khutbah al-Jumah, it's different. Mm -hmm. What, what time? You said what time? Like in Khutbah al-Jumah. Khutbah al-Jumah. According, according to the Shafi'i school, yes, you pray there. If you walk in the Masjid, and the Khatib is given the Khutbah, you still recommend it to pray there. Is By the way, that's for the mosque. So if you pray in Jumu'ah somewhere, there's not a mosque. You, it's not, you don't have to do this. I heard when, uh, let's say, you are praying, uh, the Hayat Masjid, and then the uh, Iqam Salat, uh, the Iqam is starting, uh, I heard that you have to stop. It depends. Where are you exactly during your prayer? In the mosque. No, no, no. I mean, I mean wow. like, how much you finished praying. Sometimes so if you're just starting, you, yeah, you leave your Salat. Oh, the last time. If you are, like if you in the second rak'ah, if you record second rak'ah, you'll finish your salah. No, no, I'm not saying you have to. I said you should to catch up there. If you think, if you, okay, if you think, if I keep doing it, I'm going to miss the first rak'ah of the imam, so maybe it's better to stop it. If you know, no, I'm going to just finish it quickly and then I'm going to join the imam and I will catch the first rak'ah, so you finish it. It depends. There's no, there's no wajib here. It just depends on how you evaluate the situation. Yeah, yeah, if you just finish it, you break it. But that's not going to be considered a salah. You, you, you don't get thawaf for the salah because it's not performed already. Um, what were the less highly recommended salah? What? In the sunnah, so there's the makina and the ghayyu makina. Yes. I don't know. Like the ones that are not Okay. Let me say them again. Okay, so the, the prayers that are not highly recommended as leather, the first ones are 10. Second one, the second section or the second category is two before Fajr and four before Dhuhr, four after Dhuhr, four before Asr for those who are writing, two after Maghrib and two after Isha. How many total? Twelve. No, of course more. Twelve? No, two more. Sorry, I said these are high or not high. Right, I think 18. Yeah, 18, 18, right? Yeah. Sorry? So you said these are high, not high. This, this is not the high, less recommended than the other ones. Oh, okay. They're still recommended, of course, because, but the other ones are more recommended. Again, Sunnah Mu'akkada versus Sunnah Ghir Mu'akkada means how much consistent the Prophet would be praying. This is the difference. Uh, about, uh, okay, so if someone is leading prayer, and we don't pursue their amrad uncovered. Does that invalidate your prayer? That's the first question. You, you, you're the one. No, someone is praying prayer. Okay. And they're wearing a shirt. Yeah. That when they go to sujood, it uncovers their amrad. But when they get back up, it yes. covers. That invalidates the That invalidates everybody's prayer. Everybody's prayer? No. Everybody's pra His prayer? His or prayer. My, my prayer is. Oh, prayer. like you are. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no I mean, someone is leading prayer. Ah, I'm talking about the Imam. That's what I'm asking yeah. about. Oh, you're talking about the Imam. And okay. Does that validate? No, that's a good question. I thought you talked about someone in the Jama'ah. No, no. Not some, okay. Well, actually, I want to know what. I want to about both. About both. Okay. If he's leading. If someone's leading. Yes. And their outer is uncovered and goes through, they're unaware. Mm -hmm. And they get back up and it's covered. Does that invalidate their prayer? Uh, everybody's prayers. Yeah, okay, there is a doubt about this, but generally, yes, you do. if you watch him, if you see his aura as being exposed yeah. and he didn't cover it immediately, you redo the salah. Okay. You do the salah again. But you don't announce it. This for the, no, this for the imam. For, the, for someone in the salah, no. But this is his own salah, but he doesn't affect the other people. Okay. What if you, your aura is uncovered and you immediately like, you notice and you're like... Yeah, but I said immediately, no. That's the, we, we mentioned that. About the filth and about the aura. If immediately covered or removed about the filth, this doesn't invalidate your prayer. Yes, your prayer is still okay. So for Salat al-Jama'ah, uh, Qasr Traveler, so you mentioned is it for Salat al-Jama'ah, if you go in a place not long for four days, you are a traveler. Is that the same thing for all of your obligatory uh, prayers? Or just yes, so that's a good question. So for all the ruchas, for all the options that you get because of traveling, mm -hmm. it has to be number one, long distance, which is 80 kilometers or more. Right. Number two, has to be for only four days plus the day of traveling back and forth. So the total of six days. So one day traveling, one day coming back, and four days in the middle. So because I know like some friends that asked me to ask you, like they're going to London to visit parents for, for a weekend. Okay. Some people do Jama Qasr for the weekend, like even though it's their parents' house, but they consider it traveling. Okay, so the two points here. So number one, it's a weekend, that means like two, three days. So they're, they're still below the, the, right. the, the, the time. Mm -hmm. 
So that the, the generally you can actually offer, uh, you can actually combine the prayers. About going to a place that I have a kind of a real residence for myself, or for my family, a lot of scholars said, no, you're not allowed to pray, to pray, to combine prayers there. That's different than visiting like specific parents, but visiting like more far relatives, visiting friends, yes, specific tribe. But parents who left there, and basically, so basically they have two houses. They have a house here and they have the, their parents' house. Right. No, they're not, they're not, they shouldn't make Jama'ah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Number one, was it covered immediately, or the, it lasted for, for a for long oh, time? No, but they didn't know, so it got covered, and then one was soft, like, they don't know. They and they found it after Salah? No, they don't know. If they didn't know, if they didn't know at all, they didn't have to do anything. But if they find out at the end of after Salah, and they know that the Aura was exposed for, for a long time, they have to do something with the Salah. Yes? <coughs> uh, sorry? Oh, that's a good question, especially for Ramadan. So reading from the Mus'haf during Salah. Going to the Shafi'i school, that's okay. In all prayers. Oh, obligatory. obligatory or is it recommended? But for obligatory prayers, it's not really recommended, but you can do it. That's only for Shafi'i. Adam Madhab do not permit this. Just, you need to know that. Some people will put something next to them, like a chair or something. They put it on the chair and then you go for sujood. You, you can figure it out. It's not. Or if it's a phone, you just can put it on the ground. It's better not to put it on the ground. Basically, some people, if they are forced, they don't have any choice, they keep holding it with, why during the sujood, that's not really recommended, but, so the reason that a lot of scholars are against the Mus'haf thing is because it forces you to do a lot of moves, mm -hmm. right? That's why even the, the, the lenient opinion, like the Shafi'i school, they said, do not move it a lot, do not keep turning pages a lot, try to, like, if you open it, you know that in these two rakahs, I'm ready for these two pages. Maximum one time flipping is okay. But you cannot just keep flipping back and forth and just have moving a lot. You have to, you still, you're still limited by the, 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 the point of the excess emotions that we talked about too. But you're allowed to carry them to the yes. Whether you're Imam or Imam, even for people who want to read with the Imam in Taraweeh, especially that happens in Ramadan, you want to open the Mus'haf, that's okay. To read with the Imam, to read if they pray by themselves. Yes. continues her question. Should we leave it this way when we make this retreat or It shouldn't, you shouldn't put it on the ground in general. It, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Maybe that's easier. Sure, you can keep the page open, yeah. but it doesn't matter. There's no specific way of doing that. Yeah. And if you, if you hold in the phone, just keep it open on the application. Don't open other things. So uh, yeah. <laughs> do not respond to messages or uh, see the notifications. They do not do that. You just open on the Mus'haf app, and that's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You. you yes. Dua in? A different like, in different language. Yeah. Okay, there, there, there is a khilaf among the scholars about this. And some people, that doesn't invalidate your prayer, because it's not a must thing. The must sayings in the salah are things that you have to do in Arabic. So that's not a must thing. But according to the Shafi'i school, they do not prefer having any other language in the prayer. But if you do it, that's okay. Another question, maybe some of you have it already about the du'as. So also people ask about, can I make du'a about anything? So generally, yes. Whether something related to your deen, related to your dunya, related to the akhirah and hereafter, whatever you want to ask. And this is an exception of the kalam, by the way. So you talk about, you can speak something that is not part of your prayer. But if in your sajda you want to say, oh Allah, give me a car, for example, right? That's not part of your prayer sayings that you should be saying in, 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 in dhikr or Quran, but you're allowed to do that in sujood. Again, other opinions that restrict that the du'a has to be in something related to your religion and akhira. Some said, like, whatever du'a you want to make in, in, the, in the proper time of du'a in salah, like sujood, yes, you're allowed to do that. Yes? Uh, does the du'a has to be like uh, the al-fusha or like, can it be uh, like the It's better to be a fusha, of course. Yes. It's, not, it's, not, it's not recommended to be in another uh, language or even another dialect other than the fusha. Yes. So, like, what if you're praying and then your brother passes by you, then you push him once, and he comes back again, and you push him again, and then he doesn't look again? And then, like, does that, like, invalidate your prayer because he did it three times and he came back three times? Okay, how old is the brother? That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, that, that will. Well, like, he's like five. 
Okay, so he's, uh, yeah, exactly. So he's, he's, yeah, if he's young, just let him pass. You don't, you do not do that with him. So the general sunnah, if someone is like really like an adult person, yes, you keep because the hadith said you keep fighting, like you keep pushing him, like even if he's doing that. But assuming that he's an adult person, he understands he shouldn't be doing it the second time. That's a, that's a major sin, by the way. Really, the hadith about it is subhanallah very, very interesting that there is like big threat by the Prophet Muhammad for people who do that. So, but assuming a person who's doing this with an adult and understands his, like what he's doing, if you push him or you just just put your hand like this, he's gonna understand he's not gonna do it again. Because if he's doing it more, if he's insisting, that's a major sin. If he's not, there's something wrong with him. The Prophet said, فَلْقَاتِلُهُ فَإِنَّ بَيْنَ قَدَيْهِ شَيْطَانًا See, there is a shaitan with this person who's doing that. But someone who's under the age is not mukallaf either. So he, he's not even responsible for his actions. And this is something that happens in the mosque a lot. Some people in the mosque, they get so much angry, pushing kids. He doesn't know, number one, and he's not gonna value prayer because he's not mukallaf. So it's okay. If he's a bit mumayy, it doesn't have to be like an adult. If he's like 10, 12 years old and you want to teach him and like you do any kind of a sign like do not pass, that's okay. You can do that. But someone who's that age, it's okay. Because okay. that will might like embed your own salah. If you keep doing it for no purpose. Yes. Uh, what if you're praying to the Quran by yourself and uh, you're trying to like, read as much as you can you have to what the most happen to you? Yes, you can do that. But because it takes time until you finish the page with two pages. So they're not consecutive in the terms of the most. That's okay. Um, the question is about the number one. What if there's an ijasa? Okay, I know. Two questions. Number one is the when our lesson in wudu, I was explaining to a friend what we learned, and he asked something that I wasn't sure about. You know how there's pre, like, uh, if someone, if a man loves him, really heavy things, something not deceiving itself, but something before it yes. could come out, it does that to validate in terms of the. Uh, the, what is it called? So the two questions are about wudu and about rajasa. No, yeah, what's this? That specific liquid does that? Is that just for wudu, or you have to remove it with a shower? That's the first question. And number two, if you're unaware of it, and you pray. Does it invalidate your salah? For example, you pray the hood and you weren't aware of it, and now it's like mother of half time you you discovered that. You okay. The salah. Okay. So the first question is number one. It's a it's an ajasa, yeah. regardless of which which thing it is. It's an ajasa. And he only needs to make wudu, he doesn't have to make a shah. That's the first question. The second question, if you find out about an ajasa that was a new body or a new clothes after the salah, you redo the salah. It doesn't matter which time, there is no expiration for this. Whenever you realize that, you make up the prayer that you found out there was an ajasa on your body. Yes? If you're what, what is the like first word? Like you're bedridden or, or okay. surgery or something, you can't, you can't So there are two points here about the actual physical ability of moving and about making taha, right? So about actual ability of moving the body, we said that last time, move as far as much as you can. So if you can stand up but you cannot make rukur, you do that and you bow as much as you can for rukur if you can. If you cannot, if you can make rukur but you cannot prostrate into jude, you do not prostrate into jude, you just bow a little bit with your, with your back. If you cannot do any of these things, you just, we say you can, you keep doing as much as you can do until you might be praying only by your eyes. If a person is completely paralyzed, he cannot even move, he can pray with his eyes, if he's in that bad condition. So whatever part of his body, essentially the prayer, he can move, he has to move. The rest, it's, he's not obligated to, to move him. For the, for the wudu or for the, the tahara, he should seek the help of someone to help him make an wudu. This part of things that a person is required to try to get the help of someone to make wudu. And I know that a lot of details about this. Yes. So let's say I, I went for like tooth removal and I have a sponge, I'm not to remove it, and I'm going to go make wudu. Can I skip? Eating? You have three what? I'm like let's say I have um, like gauze in my mouth for like oral surgery, and I'm not to be touching it for let's say 24 hours, 48 hours. Can I skip the madmada? Yes, because the madmada is, is the sunnah anyway. Even if it's like saturated. The question is not about Mamala, because Mamala is soon anyway. If you skip it even without an excuse, your wudu is still okay. Maybe the question is about if it's in one of the main parts, like the hand or like the, like the, the face, right? Mm -hmm. No, oral for me. Right? Oral, no, oral is okay. no problem anyway, because it's. Uh, unless if there's something that you would swallow while you're praying. Other than it's alive, of course. Like blood, right? Yeah, you, you try as, as much as you can not, not, not swallow it. If something like you swallow unintentionally, that's okay. Yes. You, you cannot rinse your mouth? Sorry? You cannot rinse your mouth? No, usually and there is blood in the mouth? You cannot do anything about it? Because the, the problem here is not only that there is something in your mouth, it's something that jazz in your mouth. Correct. 
That's 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 another problem. So let's say you get your wisdom to a three You get what? You like give the wisdom to a three Okay? So now there's a hole in the mouth, right? And you usually cover it with gauze and you're not to basically touch it for twenty four hours. That's okay. If it's if it's covered there's there's filling there, right? Yeah, it's like that's okay. Or, yeah, filling and then blood. There's no problem. But you try I mean the dentist will do that anyway. Just before the last filling, he just clean it as much as he can. We do that anyway. We just that's with the intention of that trying to make it clean as much as I can. But you cannot do more than this. You're asking about how to start the row or how to fill the gaps? Two how, different things. How to fill the gaps? Like if there's gaps in what the do you mean the gaps? So the, the, the row is not full. Yeah. Right? So you start with the right side first. Right. You didn't have to, but that's the same. You start with the right side first and then the left side. If you enter the mosque and there's like half row and you want to fill it, go to the right. If you go to the left, that's fine, but you go to the right first and then you, you do it to the right to the, like the wall, for example, and then you complete the other half of the world. And if someone moves, we have to <laughs> the, from the left? No, nobody moves. Who's moving? Yeah. Leave. 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 Okay. So you finish the two rakahs, because tarawih, they're, they're just email every now and then, right? You finish the two rakahs. Once you finish the two rakahs, yes, you fill that gap, you move. But do move while you're praying. No, no, you, didn't, you do not have to. You can, it's short, but over two steps, no, you move. I mean, if it's like, I cannot move from here to the wall, for example, to fill a gap. <laughs> that happens, no, it shouldn't be happening, because that imbalance was And this is what people need to realize. Filling a gap, filling a gap is a sunni. But moving a lot will the prayer. So you have to understand these priorities. Do you, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Again, you need to understand these priorities. If you're in a gap, you have something good. Because it's a sunnah. You need to fill the gap in the soft, in the row and so that. Right? But if I'm going to move a lot, that would invalidate my prayer, I shouldn't, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't fill the gap. Leave it. Somebody else will come and fill it or not, it's okay. Salah is still okay. Salah, everybody is still okay. But if you're talking about like one step, two steps, that's okay. Right? Sometimes in the salah, for example, the row right in front of me. We started praying and then they squeezed in and they left again. Yes, I can move. It's just one step, one step and a half. That's okay. But two, three rows, I should be moved. But that's a lot. Yes? Are you allowed to mention the dua that was mentioned in the Quran in your prayer? Like in sujood, for example? Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's a dua. That's actually it's a good thing to do. Yes? Uh, how do you reconcile the missing complicated salah? What do you mean reconcile? So you miss some salah from so okay. you reconcile it or in your past back, uh, past time, say it's a couple of years since you started, you missed a lot of salah in your life. So how do you reconcile them? You you make them up. This is the question? Yeah. Yeah, you have to make them up. No, no, if I say What do you mean reconcile? I don't know. What do you mean reconcile with salah? So can I can uh, offer that prayer? So in my last ten years, 12, 12 years or fifteen years, I didn't offer salah. So oh okay. Yeah. So Okay, that's the, th that's the tough question because a lot of scholars actually say it doesn't matter how many prayers you missed, you have to make them up all. That's, that's like 99% of scholars said it doesn't matter how many prayers you miss in your life. As long as you were a Muslim and you were a mukallaf since you became a, a, an adult responsible person, you have to make up all the prayers. Some scholars, very few scholars said it's very hard. If it's like 10, 20 years, that's really hard on a person to do. So he's required to try to pray as much as he can, but he is not required to actually pray all these prayers together. But that's like the opinion of like one, two percent of all the scholars all over history. So it's really tough. It's really yeah. tough. Yeah. Because like maybe, I mean, theoretically, what I believe in personally, yes, he has to make them up. But it's not really that easy. What was the process for that? He make them up. But I mean, like he distribute them. He, he make them up over time. Some people like pray another prayer with. Yeah, he prays the Lord. He prays another Lord after. So he prays one extra prayer with each one. So he prays 10 times a day, basically. Each prayer is compi not combined, but he follows it with the same prayer, with the intention of making up a prayer that I missed before. That this is one of the ways, or two or three. It depends on how, how much, like, what well he has, he has. And he shouldn't waste, not really waste, but he shouldn't occupy the time by praying sunnah. He knows he has far to make up. He shouldn't pray far, he just keep praying. He shouldn't pray sunnah. He should keep praying, uh, 
the, the fault that he missed before. Yes. What if you have like a really bad mosquito bite and then you like you itch it three times? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just to finish the, the, the moving things, again, unintentional moves is okay. Intentional moves, you try to control it not over, two, not over three times, even if it's really itching. Okay? Because you might hurt yourself if you do it over three times anyway. So it's not good. Yes. Uh, sisters. Sisters. With what? I think we talked about this before. With these normal light socks, no. You have to take them off. The khuf, the foot gear that the Sahaba used to wipe over during their salat. This, there's a chapter in, in, in Tahara that's called the Mas'ha al-Khuf, wiping the, the foot gear. It's the one that is from leather or from any substance that is really thick. That basically it's a kind of a shoe that you can, you can wear and, and walk in. But this, most of our socks do not apply to this. So you need to wash your, your feet because they do not apply to al-Khuf. Can you wear, uh, for example, you're wearing shoes. Can you just wipe over your shoes and play? Yes, if it's above the ankle. If, if it goes above the ankle. The shoes that are, that are above the ankles, you can wipe over them. So if you're out, you're on a trip, you're in driving anywhere, you don't want to take them off, you, you, you wipe over them. But with all the other conditions, so you put them on Tahara first, right? You put them on Tahara. You didn't take them off with the socks, and then you put them back again. There are some other conditions that happen. Whatever conditions that you know about the hoof, the same thing applies for the shoes. But it's not about the name, it's about the condition. It's about the description of the thing that you wear. It's called socks, it's called khuf, it's called uh, halal socks, it's called uh, shoes, it doesn't matter. Because there are really, there are some socks that are being sold that, that have these requirements. They are called socks, but they have requirements of the actual foot gear that is in the sunnah. And, and some of them are, are like uh, legitimate, some of them are really prescribed, and, and I mean approved by scholars, that those have, they're very thin, but they have all the conditions of the foot gear. So, and they're available online if you want to buy them. Can you bring shoes? Yes, it's like it is. The Sahaba used to bring shoes because they didn't have carpets in the mosque. But they had to make sure that it's Tahir. Because, I mean, now it's mostly Tahir because there's not a lot of filth in the streets like before. But before, because they might be stepping in filth, you would just make sure it's Tahir. Uh, but you sometimes just, but just rubbing it in the dust before entering the mosque, and that's it. The Sahaba would, would do that. So generally, praying in, in shoes is okay. Have a couple of minutes. Yes. So adding to her question, because you she mentioned about the mouth and it's part sunnah of the wudu. But you said if the part that's covered and it's we're supposed to, it's obligatorily part of for wudu, like face or hands, and then it's covered or mm, no, there's two different things. So her question was about skipping. We can skip it, but yeah. I'm saying it's like obligatory. What would we do about it? If part of the None of that. Her question was about the blood in the mouth. She's right. basically carrying blood while the, she's praying. That's okay. that's a difference there. I just tell you if there's a bandage, if there's something that we have on, on, on our face or on our, on our arms, okay. if you can take it off to make a look, you can wipe over it. Yes, you can wipe over it. There are some, uh, some other. In this case, if somebody has any kind of bandage and it's going to last, I would recommend that he talks to a scholar to a because there are a lot of different details about this. Because how big is the bandage? Because did he put it on Tahara or not? Because is there blood or not? There are a lot of other details. So it's sometimes stuff for some sick people, but generally it's better just to make sure by consulting someone who knows these hakat. Yes. Just to confirm, you have to remove the socks and then the movement is okay, right? Yeah. If if they do not qualify to be, if they do not qualify, you have of course to remove them and make and wash your feet. Yes. Alhamdulillah, we're good. Okay. So because next time we're not gonna talk about prayer anymore. Last question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> No, but this is what I said. It has to be four days total of six days, including everything, total of six days. Okay. Yes. By the way, I'm going to put a point about this one. Staying, it's called staying versus resident versus, versus tra traveler, right? This is goes this goes by the intention. So if you intend to stay over six days, you cannot have Qasr al Jamah once you reach the destination. You get that? You cannot just keep doing Qasr and Jama' and then after six days you stop. No. Residence goes by the intention. Basically by your ticket, by your whatever you plan that you have for your trip. Right? This is, this is very, very important. Because some people, a lot of people actually think, okay, I reach the place, I can make Qasr and Jama' for the first four or five days and then I stop. No. It's by the intention, by your plans basically. Intention of your plans for your travel. You cannot have, uh, 
you, you decide if you can have Qasr or Rajab. I said that was the question. So I'm going to take it after the, uh, the class, I'm sorry. Uh, so just before we finish, so again, next time, inshallah, we're going to be, it has to be basically the last halaqa and fiqh. We have to cover both fasting and zakah. We try to focus more on fasting because it's more uh, kind of a priority nowadays before talking about the, the zakah, inshallah. And then other two lectures, brothers, sisters, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not done yet. Just one minute, one minute. The other two lectures will be on, on spirituality and we're going to conclude the, the kitab or the book, inshallah, before Ramadan. During Ramadan, there is not going to be a class. Inshallah, we'll tell you soon what is the plan for after Ramadan, what is the next class, inshallah. If you're still interested to attend, if not, it's okay. Uh, during Ramadan, we're going to have an, a potluck like iftar. So we'll send you more details about the iftar. Uh, we confirmed the date because we had to book the hall here, so the date unfortunately is already booked, so if it doesn't suit your time, I don't think we will have another option. So we booked both halls, one for brothers and one for sisters. It's going to be a palak iftar. It's going to be for both and majlis program for both Arabic and majlis because we have another stream in Arabic language. So in both and majlises, Arabic and English. It's open for everybody. If you want to invite some other people, that's okay. But just for the sake of organization, we'll send you a, an email with a spreadsheet. Not necessarily now, maybe in Ramadan starts, inshallah. To just fill it with the, whatever things you, you want to, to bring in the uh, iftar, inshallah. So we'll send you more details, but I just wanted to give you a heads up about the, the iftar program in Ramadan. That will be maybe the only gathering, official gathering that we would have in Ramadan, inshallah. And then after Ramadan, in June, inshallah, or end of June, we'll start the, the, the new class, inshallah. Um, yes, Jazakallah khair. So there is a quiz, uh, before I forget, that will be shared with you, inshallah, uh, about tahara and prayer. So just about this part, that will be sent before next class, inshallah. Uh, next class, we'll discuss it in short because we're really tight on time, and then we'll finish the other fiqh part, inshallah. That's all? Okay, Jazakum Allah, Assalamu alaikum.